No. In our last segment, Rene Vasquez related his uh, dealings with the Judicial Committee. Ray actually quoted Rene's letter to the Judicial Committee with whom he had to deal, and we made the comment how different this was. These continued Star Chamber performances in Bethel in 1980-81, how different this way of doing justice justice hmm, was to the way that justice was served in the early church. You know, confrontations between the apostles in Galatians and in Acts. That most famous chapter of Acts to a Jehovah's Witness 15. And how all of this mirrored the Sanhedrin and the way multiple points of view were tolerated in the the government, the, the most prominent system of governance that Judaism had between about around the year 500 BC and the era of the Apostles, the Sanhedrin tolerated multiple points of view and confrontations happened in that context among 70 men at the highest levels of Judaism. So how different this is as uh, Ray continues his description of what happened to Rene Vasquez and his wife Elsie. Some 30 years earlier, René had left his father's home to escape what he felt was an oppressively intolerant atmosphere, narrow-mindedness. He sought freedom to pursue his interest in Jehovah's Witnesses. From then on, he had given himself heart and soul to service among them. Now, in the space of two weeks, he saw those 30 years set aside as of no particular weight. He was subjected to intense interrogation, his sincerity, of motive was impugned, and he had been labeled a rebel against God and Christ. His letter voices his painful anguish on finding himself in the same atmosphere of religious intolerance and narrow-mindedness he thought he had escaped. Rene was granted an appeal and again met with a committee formed of five other elders. Every effort he made to be conciliatory, to show that he was not seeking to make an issue of specific doctrinal matters, that he had no desire to be dogmatic about such, was rejected as evasive, as evidence of guilt. At one point, after hours of being plied with questions, he was interrupted by Sam Friend, a member of the appeal committee, who said, that is a lot of hogwash. Now I'm going to read this list of questions to you, and I want you to answer them yes or no. To René, whose native language is Spanish, the term hogwash was unfamiliar, and although afterward deciding it was simply some regional expression, he says that at the time it hit him with such a literal image of filth that something gave inside him. And he responded, no, I'm not going to answer any more of your questions. You men are trying to sift my heart, and I'm not going to endure any more of it. A recess in the session was called. René walked out and on reaching the street, broke down in tears. The committee upheld the disfellowshipping decision. Of all the persons Rene had known and worked with in the Brooklyn Service Department, including those who had been willing to make use of his kindness and helpfulness over many years, not one appeared to say at least something in his behalf to express any request for a similarly kind treatment toward him. On the organization's scales of justice, his undeniable sincerity, his unmarred record of the past 30 years, none of this carried any weight if he did not totally agree with the organization and maintain unquestioning silence. Somewhere in all this, it would seem that the words of the disciple James have application when he writes, Talk and behave like people who are going to be judged by the law of freedom, because there will be judgment without mercy for those who have not been merciful themselves. But the merciful need have no fear of judgment. Finally, on May 8th, 1980, the governing body officially informed me that my name was involved in this. A phone call came from Chairman Albert Schroeder, and he, he said that the governing body wanted me to go to Brooklyn to appear before them. This was the first time they gave me any indication whatsoever of my being in any way under question. Fifteen days had passed since our previous conversation, in which the chairman repeatedly evaded telling me what was actually taking place. I still was unaware of the existence of the two-hour taped interview, or that it had been played to the governing body in full session. 
Twenty-three days had passed since this was done. In those twenty-three days, they had not only played that tape to the governing body, but had played portions of it, including my name and that of Ed Dunlap, to at least seventeen persons outside the body, those forming investigative and ju judicial committees. They had disfellowshipped three members of the headquarters staff and three persons outside, one of them a friend of mine for thirty years. They had taped another interview with a man named Bonelli, a tape that will be discussed later, and in general had not only invite, invited but had actively sought any evidence of an incriminating nature that could be obtained from members of the Bethel family or others, the threat of disfellowshipping even being used to extract information from some. Only after all this did the governing body, through its chairman's committee, think it advisable to let me know that they viewed me as in any way implicated in what was taking place. Why? So still there's been no direct accusation. We'll take that up in the next segment.